What's up, y'all? Hey, guys. <laughs> Hello, and thank you so much for coming tonight. <laughs> Y'all look so gorgeous. Yeah. So cute. <laughs> so you were just back home for the weekend, and you performed in Kansas City, and you brought Dirty Computer there. Was that the first time you brought it on tour? Yes. First time um, that the majority of my family got the opportunity to see the show. Um, we're almost like, we only have like maybe two more shows left for the tour, so it's, it was bittersweet, but it felt like a really big homecoming. Um, I had cousins that I hadn't talked to in years asking for tickets, so it was a little stressful, but it was just great to go home and to perform for the tribe of people who um, have directly inspired me and helped me become the young woman I am today. Do any of your family members have specific favorite songs from the album that they were tearing up to? Yeah, my dad loves I Like That. Like, that's his... <laughs> That's his, that's his song. Um, they love Make Me Feel. Yeah, people like different songs for different things, but pretty much everyone is very vocal about what they don't like and what they love. <laughs> I, I come from that family. And um, I want to get really deep into the songwriting process and everything leading up to the creation of Dirty Computer. And I was listening to the Song Exploder podcast that you had recently done. And I wanted to kind of dig into that idea of these, I know that I'm So Afraid was written in 2015, or at least the beginnings of it were kind of formulating. Um, how far back do a lot of the songs from Dirty Computer go? Yeah, 2015 was probably rough demo like two. This album, the title was actually conceived before the Arc Android. So I had Dirty Computer as an idea and what that meant before Arc Android and then we were in the middle of finishing Arc Android, we put that out and then we did Electric Lady and then I came back to Dirty Computer um, after I had enough time to, to live. I felt like I needed, I needed to experience more things in my life before I, I dug into this album. I knew it was gonna require a, a significant amount of understanding where I was, um, a significant amount of being, allowing myself to go through all the emotions that are in, that are in the album from being angry, being introspective, um, celebrating, questioning, um, and just being, you know, just being comfortable with not having the answers and just waiting and being patient with myself. And what were some experiences that you were able to have in that time and what did that entail for you? The experiences I was able to have had a lot to do with the time that we are in now. I started writing this project in the Obama era. As you all know, a lot has changed <laughs> since then. And at first I started to only make this album about me and where I am and you know what's going on in my head. But as things changed politically, as a lot of unforeseen or, yeah, a lot, a, a lot. When things started to change drastically, drastically in our country, I started to have the word community at the forefront and a need for community and a need for community, the people in that community to feel more safe. Um, and I think this album is a mixture of personal stories, but also written for the community of dirty computers, those who are marginalized and pushed to the margins of society because of who they love, where they come from, what class they're in, lower class in particular, um, uh, people, you know, women, um, all my brothers and, and sisters in the LGBTQIA community, um, black folks, uh, the, my disabled people, um, immigrants, uh, I can go, I can, I can name more uh, folks that I've seen, their voices 
not listened to by those in the position of power. And I felt like it was going to be important to create an album and a concert experience where we all felt um, like it was our, our personal church, our personal safe space, despite what the rest of the world said, says about uh, us. Because the truth of it is, is when I take these braids out and I take off my performance outfit, when I go home, I'm still a young black queer woman who grew up to working class, lower class parents, that is my reality. And for me, it was just important to celebrate um, those dirty computers. And I want to unpack that a little bit, just the idea of, you know, we were always talking about what it means to create a political album in this era and what that looks like. I think people were anticipating the protest art to come out of it. and. I feel like Dirty Computer is a great example of how the political is the personal and our bodies become the political protest. And do you see Dirty Computer as a piece of protest art or how do you see it in the greater landscape of that narrative? Well, whenever I'm writing the project, I, I wanna be as honest and truthful to uh, where I am at that time. And that's first and, and foremost. Um, I don't go into it thinking I want to make a political album. I think that I am inspired by what is around me. Um, I am motivated to move based on the things that happen in my life, the things that happen in this country. Um, I, have, I have felt a deeper responsibility uh, to allow music to be a, a, a tool and a vessel um, for those who are out there on the front lines, for those who are, are trying to discover themselves in the same way that I'm trying to discover and appreciate myself as I evolve. Um, and I think that's just a natural progression and evolution uh, that happens with me as, as an artist. And when I spoke to you back in March about the album and about the idea of letting go of Cindy Mayweather and of letting go of, you know, this character that you had built and that was also sort of an aspirational process. Tell me about the difference, going back to the writing process, of writing for a specific character versus writing very personal lyrics about yourself. Well, I must say that every album that I've written is, is personal. You know, it's, it's, it's a reflection of where I am at that time. And I wanna say that Cindy Mayweather has been directly responsible for helping me um, deal with a lot of my bugs and viruses. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, and, and those things that I'm working through and those things that um, inspired the project, as I mentioned earlier, Dirty Computer was an album concept before the ARC Android. So if you look in the DNA code, Cindy is still here. She's been there all along. If you um, watch the emotion picture for like the hardcore fam droids, <laughs> you guys will know that the DNA, like we're, we're, we're all connected. You know, it's, it's an interconnectedness that um, is between Cindy and me and the future and the past and the present. And I hope that it just reminds us, um, yeah, that, they're, that, that, that we're connected as, as much as we try to distance ourselves from each other or we say that that was written from that perspective. This person is still a part of me, still in my heart, and still very much so inspiring me to continue to create art. And I want to know a little bit about the process of working, I know specifically with Nate Rocket and Chuck Lightning, that they are two great collaborators that you worked with a lot on Dre Computer, and what, um, what does that process look like when you guys are writing the songs and writing the music together in Wonderland and what, take us inside of a, maybe a typical song for you. Well, you know, those who saw the, the or listened to the song Exploder, um, for example, with So Afraid, I was on the way to the dentist writing that song. Like I had, oh my goodness, my tooth was just aching and, I had taken some Advil and I had a little relief during that time, but I had to go to the dentist to figure out what was going on. And 
here I am driving and like I have my voice um, memo on my phone and I just started singing those melodies um, to the song first. And the background vocals is, is crazy. They they sound airy and like my mouth is open wide because when I was sitting in the dentist chair, I literally was still trying to remember and come up with melodies because I had to wait on my dentist. He takes too long sometimes. <laughs> Um, but he's amazing. Um, and so I'm like, oh, and I just kept that and I kept that vibe and I rushed back home after the dentist and um, called Nate and asked him to come. And he heard the, the song. I had the drum idea that I wanted it to, it to, I had the drum arrangement that I wanted to happen. Um, and I wanted him to play guitar because whenever I'm writing a song, if I can't play it on a piano or on a guitar, I always feel like, um, as a songwriter, I haven't created something that can be used for a long time. You know, you'll be at somebody's house. You may find yourself at another artist's house, and you're around the campfire, and you know you want to play songs. And I w I've always wanted to be able to play my songs, just. Uh, with the bare uh, instrumentation. And so we started with guitar first, and a lot of it was me just guiding Nate. And obviously he's produced more music um, than, than I have as a music producer. But one of the things with Nate and Chuck is whenever I bring an idea uh, to the table, which I really love about them, is that even though they may have had more experience in certain areas, they allow me to guide that process and are very patient and want to make sure that my idea and how I heard it in my head, um, the integrity of that is, is, is it, it remains. And it, it, you know, they're very respectful of, of my concepts and ideas. And so sometimes we have those moments where I'll come in and I'm like, I want you to play like this, this, and then we do that. And then other times um, I can wake up from a dream and have a mel melodic idea and it just sit there for a minute. Nate has all has also, uh, and Chuck, they have both, we've all three had melodic ideas in our dreams. It's weird and we'll come down and be like, yo, like this is what I, what I dreamt. We did a lot of that on the Arc Android, on all the albums, we've had those moments. So it's just like you just gotta remain open. Um, yeah, remain open. Chuck and I uh, conceptualize a lot together. Chuck Lightning is, is our other um, creative partner, and he was the one who introduced me to Metropolis. I didn't know anything about that German expressionist film, you know, by first Lang. I didn't, I didn't know, I started to get into science fiction hev a lot when I met Chuck, because he's also a screenwriter. So we just each, I guess, have, I guess, our own superpowers, and we, you know, help out and contribute to make the best product that we possibly can and the best art that we possibly can selflessly. And um, I know that you engineer your own songs. Can you tell me about learning that skill and also the importance of having yourself, you know, engineer your own music and be responsible and independent in that way? Yeah, so I started engineering myself during the Arc Android era. Um, I'm a private person when when I'm in the nascent in the in the nascent stage when in the 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 when I'm trying to form the song and form an idea and you know when I would go in, in and work with different engineers in different cities they all be amazing but one of the things I felt was just pressure to like deliver at a high level and to be perfect. Even if that was not on their minds, I felt like they were looking for me to come in and like just have all the answers. And sometimes you're just feeling your way through. You just don't have the answers. And it can be very frustrating. And so what I decided to do, um, and then also when I do have the answers, I go at a very fast pace and I don't wanna be rude and I don't want to feel like I have to apologize for being like yo did you press record what are we recording the, oh you missed that like you know it can just take you out the rhythm so I just said listen I need to learn how to engineer myself I need to allow myself space to mess up and and to you know to not do things right and I will say that doing that gives me a great appreciation for engineers 
Um, it's helped me have a lot of private time with who I am. Um, I've come up with some crazy vocal arrangements and just characters um, uh, that I just would have not done if everybody was around me. Um, so yeah, I like to I like to work alone majority of the time, but I think it's also important to collaborate and to allow others to see that process because I think there is power in vulnerability. There is power in showing people um, your mistakes or you know your filling your way through and just everybody being like we don't all, we don't have we don't have it figured out we don't we don't have it figured out and it's okay yeah no that builds on to my next question of the idea of someone who is so has such a very specific and self-owned creative vision when you work with people who are kind of new to your creative process like Julia Michaels on make me feel or Pharrell like what what is that process like of bringing in almost outsiders kind of to well, I think the people who I collaborate with, the artists that I collaborate with, there's a kinship there. You know, regardless of if we've never collaborated before, when we say, yes, let's get in the studio, we are saying that we share this common um, love for this idea. And let's, let's learn from each other. You know, let's, let's figure out how we can innovate. I think that's when innovation happens, when different worlds collide. And I always enjoy learning. I will say that, you know, although I engineer myself majority of my projects, but I do take time to go and understand, well, how is she writing this? Or how is a Pharrell producing? Let me just be a fly on the wall. Let me figure out how I can um, learn and then bring back uh, some of those techniques or, or um, you know, ways of, of, of creating that the artists and writers I respect live by. And um, you have so many incredible guest artists on the album, with from Brian Wilson to Zoe Kravitz, Thundercat, Grimes, Pharrell. I mean, just all these people working with you on it. Um, I know that you had a lot of them in mind when you were writing the songs. Like, I know that you had watched a uh, Beach Boys documentary and you wanted Brian Wilson to do the harmonies. And um, when you played Pink, you hoped that Grimes, that was the song that she picked out. And um, tell me about envisioning these collaborators, these friends, to kind of come on and sing and perform on these songs? Yeah, with Brian Wilson, actually Brian Wilson, um, shout out to the Beach Boys, just in, incredible. Um, Brian Wilson was the first uh, feature I locked in. I thought he was gonna be like the most difficult. And because of who he is and, and I didn't have like a personal um, number for him and I had to like go through some people to reach him. But when we reached out, um, it, it was so funny, he, he requested, this is, I've never gotten this request, he was like, yeah, can she send it to me on a tape? And I was like, <laughs> now Brian, now you know we don't got no tapes. Um, but no, I, I ended up sending him a CD, I wanna say. Yeah, I think we, we, we sent him an MP3 and we sent him that as a backup, but I thought that was really cool that he was like, I don't care how rapid or you know, technology is, is, is moving, I wanna take, I wanna be able to listen to it in this way. And he was just such a sweetheart, he heard the song and he recorded it like that. It was so fast, um, but I had him, him in mind because Dirty Computer is an introspective song. I wanted you to be in my head, the mind of a dirty computer. And I just remember listening to In My Room by the Beach Boys and just loving those uh, harmonies. And I'd, I'd heard that they would sing softly uh, because they didn't want their parents to, to, to hear them recording. And I was like, that's, that's the tone and that's, um, that's the vibe, that's the energy I want people to feel when they listen to Dirty Computer. Grimes is a great friend of mine. She's my sister. Um, I love creating with her. And we had just been trying to figure it out. And she's such a dirty computer. She's such a dirty computer. And, and I just thought it, it ha has to make sense. I think with every collaborator, Zoe Kravitz and I share the same birthday. Uh, we're a lot alike in many ways. And she's a dirty computer, too. I was picking dirty computers, you know. Um, during, you know, Brian Wilson, dirty computer. Pharrell, dirty computer. Um, I might be missing some folks. Um, I have John Bryan on the album as well, who is one of my favorite uh, composers. Dirty computer. I mean, when people heard the concept of the album, honestly, they were just like, 
I think we all were just like looking at the world and feeling um, the shift that was happening and being afraid and feeling like, well, how can we contribute? You know, some people go and they protest um, and they're physically present uh, and, and artists and musicians do want to figure out, well, how can I um, fight back against the abuse of power? Because there are songs like Screwed and Django Jane um, that, that do uh, respond to the way uh, women are treated in this country, um, the way that Americans who want to bridge gaps and not create them you know, want to be treated in, that in, in this country. And so uh, a lot of it had to do with them understanding what I was trying to do, what I was trying to say, and them saying, you know what, I want to help out. I want to be an ally to you right now. Although I'm a middle-aged white man, you know, or I'm from Canada, I think it's important that we show this unity on this album and do what we can and use music as a tool to bring people together. And um, how did a lot of them respond when they saw what you had set the music to with the emotion picture and saw the way that you had kind of created these just really elaborate and gorgeous visuals to accompany these collaborations? Well, I got, a lot, I got, um, I got the opportunity to play them some of the visuals before. Um, I worked actually with another young woman that I have to highlight. Uh, her name is Wynne Bennett, and she is a part of um, a duo. It is slipping my mind right now. Oh, it's slipping my mind, it's slipping my mind. Anyway, Wynne is an amazing composer, um, music producer, and she did a lot of the scoring on uh, the Dirty Computer Emotion Picture along with Nate. So I had the opportunity to sit with John Bryan as well and um, just let him uh, bring his scoring ideas uh, to the table and just show them afterwards uh, the finished project. And it was, it was a very emotional moment for, for all of us to see it come together because it almost didn't happen. Like there were for instance, Django Jane, the video that's out for that, I shot a whole nother video to Django Jane. And the special uh, effects was gonna take like two, was gonna take two weeks longer and we needed to release it in a week. And I was mortified. I was, I was like, oh my God, cause Make Me Feel was done and we were gonna release Django and Make Me Feel together and we were just like, this is gonna mess up the whole deadline. Like this is, this is we, we can't do this. So we wrote a treatment on Sunday and we shot it on Tuesday and had to have it in on the Wednesday. <laughs> so what you see is a project of, peop of everybody coming together um, to, to make this happen. And I just, I owe them my right toe. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mean, you're obviously a very visual songwriter, but were you, were a lot of those treatments kind of in your mind while you were recording the songs or kind of like in production or did they come later when you listened to the full project and thought about what the emotion picture would look like? They came, some of them came when I was writing the songs. I will say as a writer and when I'm recording, um, I want the songs to be able to be, to perform and connect with people. I don't want it to just be like, oh, that's a great recording, but you can't perform this live and it's not gonna, it's not gonna connect to the people who are, who are there. Um, so it's important that I can visualize myself on stage, whether it be a ballad, a mid-tempo, up-tempo, on stage performing it. Um, and it's also important that I can have a visual uh, that, that I'm thinking about as I'm, as I'm writing it. But it starts off with you know, writing the song, getting that out, recording it, and then making sure that you can perform it live and then I go into like, okay, what is the visual gonna be? And sometimes the visual can come and you're like, I want a song that does this. But mostly, you know, the, the, the first uh, way of describing what I just did is how I, how I work. Yeah. And I mean, getting to see the way that you translate the film and the album to the stage for the Dirty Computer tour and to see that you had brought to life so many of these scenes that you had put on film. Um, what was that process of kind of 
curating the tour and bringing kind of very specific music videos and very lively and colorful visual spaces to live venues. Yeah, yeah, it's been really exciting uh, to, to bring Dirty Computer um, to many different stages. I mean, we've played festivals and we've done theaters and um, I think one of the things that was important for me is to make sure that we did not crowd the stage with too much theatrics and too much visuals because I will say as a concert goer and somebody who you know wants to connect with the artist, it was important that I could have the connection with everybody who flew in and drove in and you know bought tickets the first day they, they were on sale. It was important that we can just have that dirty computer to dirty computer connection. Um, and then it was like, okay, well, how can we make, once we have the basic, the core songs that we're gonna do, we rehearsed and we've created a show that if we didn't have any costumes on and we didn't have any visuals, um, can this tour stand the test of time? Like, is the showmanship there? Is the musicianship there? Are my vocals right? Is my dancing right? Am I hitting my notes correctly? Like, base, I'm, a, I'm like, don't skip the basics. And so then we added on um, to, to, to weave everything together and, and to make sure that it felt cohesive and it felt cinematic. Yeah, we did that, we did that afterwards. And shifting gears a bit because you are the busiest person and you, <laughs> I don't know how you get everything done because you filmed Moonlight and Hidden Figures while you were writing recording it. I'm guessing you also were filming Welcome to Marwin during kind of the latter stages of Dirty Computer. Um, tell me about the process of embodying the characters that you do embody in these films and writing your own music and balancing those two kind of mindsets, or I guess like three or four yeah. mindsets. Yeah, people always ask me like, which one do you enjoy most? And, and I grew up, you know, as a, as a, uh, a theater kid, as a, a choir kid. Um, I wrote at the Young Playwrights, uh, the Coterie Theater's Young Playwrights Roundtable where they picked uh, 12 inner city kids and it, we would write these short stories and if our short stories were, were great enough then um, the actors would perform it. And I just always grew up flex, you know, not flexing but <laughs> <laughs> flexing. What am I talking about? I grew up exercising my muscle uh, in the arts. You know, the art saved my life. I just want to say a shout out to any music teachers or, um, you know, any, anybody who is making sure that uh, kids have the arts in the school. It kept me from whew, getting in a lot of trouble. I really, thank you. Um, but so I grew up always loving uh, uh, film and, and theater, and I would do talent showcases um, and perform like some of my favorite artists' uh, work. And you know, I just love being an artist and storytelling, whether I'm storytelling through music or I'm telling a story through film, through theater, through literature. I just think storytelling is a way to connect humanity. I think that you can empathize um, with people through storytelling. And then once you empathize with them, then you might start to like them. Then you might start to love them. And then you might start to see yourself in them and want to protect them. And I think that's when humanity can unite through storytelling. So um, it's, it's just been great to do that with Moonlight. It's been great to do that with Hidden Figures. Um, it's been great to do that with Welcome to Marwin. Um, I will say that putting your own album out is totally different than being a part of a movie. When you're in an ensemble, you're doing, you're playing, you know, you're playing a character. Uh, you can, if something goes wrong, you can blame it on production. You know, be like, well, the director told me to do whatever. Um, you know, you're doing what's right for that movie, for that film. When you are putting out an album, everything is under your name. From the snare drum to the visual, it's always what Janelle said. Did you hear what she said on this album? It's directly a reflection of your ideas and your beliefs. And people buy your music because they want to know what you feel. What are you on at this time? Um, so it's, a, it's, it's actually more scary for me to release an album because I'm just like, well, these are my feelings right now. Are they going to be embraced? You know. Um, 
you know, you just have to, and it, and it holds you accountable, and it, and it makes you, it makes me feel more, um, I don't know, more free in just owning, you know, my truth and walking in my truth. And having worked on these films, do you have a desire to get behind the camera or write feature-length films? Um, I mean, especially after making the motion picture as well, too. Yes, absolutely. I'm excited about getting into directing. Um, whenever I'm doing people, the directors that I work with, and I work with some really amazing <laughs> folks like uh, Andrew uh, Donna, Donahoe, and um, I work, excuse me? What? <laughs> no, we're not talking about the same person. I love you though. Wherever you are back there. <laughs> anyway, Andrew Dada, Donahoe. Um, and I worked with Lacey Duke. I worked with uh, Emma Westenberg. I worked with Chuck Lightning. I worked with Alan Ferguson. And one of the things that they would say is like, when I, and I didn't notice this for a while, but when I, you know, step on, on, on set, I'm directing as I'm going. Like, I'm the type of person that will do a take, and then I'll be like, okay, let me see, show me the monitor. I improve faster, and I'm able to um, uh, uh, just improve faster whenever I'm able to look at it and understand and see what I'm doing wrong or what I'm, what's working and, and what's not. So I'm always in a direct, I'm very objective about uh, my work, you know, and I think, um, that just, I don't know, I just feel like naturally I would, I would want to direct um, and also work with other directors. I'm, I'm partnering um, uh, with Belvedere, actually, and I got them to help give money and, and, and um, uh, resources to um, these women directors that I love. Um, Janixa Bravo, I don't know if you guys know her, um, Kristen Lepore, uh, Lacey, um, I just, I've, I'm really excited about their short stories that they're telling and it's all built around what does a beautiful future look like to you? And so each of their short films is just, is different and, and they just had the opportunity to do that. So yeah, I'll cross that bridge and, and be locked in and focused when it's time. And of course that's with your incredible organization, Fem the Future, and I'm wondering what other projects you have with Femme the Future that you're hoping to accomplish and have kind of brewing. Yeah, you're right, I didn't even, so it's under Femme the Future, and one of the things that Femme the Future uh, is, is gonna do, and what I hope um, it can do, is c to continue to be a grassroots organization that's led by women and men to help create more opportunities for women. Um, one of the things that I notice with doing music and film is that there is not a lot of women at the head of those tables, making those decisions. You know, um, I think that women telling stories more and us being able to see ourselves represented more is important for all of us. Um, and one of the things that I wanna do is change that and I wanna make sure that when we go in a room that we're feminine up, you know, that in, in, in those who identify as women as well is not, you don't need to have a vagina to be considered a woman, in my opinion. And I wanna make sure that um, we're being able to, tell, to, 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 to help give resources to, um, to folks who want to tell these stor stories in universal ways. And of course, Welcome to Marwin is coming up very soon. It comes out in December, correct? Yeah, I think yeah. December 21st. Yeah. yeah. Um, can you tell me a little bit about working with Steve Carell and working on this character for the film? Yes, uh, first of all, I'm such a fan of Steve Carell. I'm a huge, huge fan. Um, yeah, I'm still sick that The Office is like not a thing anymore. <laughs> so I'm just like watching reruns at this point. Um, but it was amazing to work with him. He is gonna, uh, he was just exceptional on, on stage. And uh, I play a um, amputee, but only in the real world, Steve Carell creates, his character Mark creates a surreal world where I'm a doll and I'm 
you know, have both of my legs and I'm running around and I'm killing Nazis <laughs> with other dolls from around the world. <laughs> yeah, it's, if I, yeah, those of you <laughs> who are following me right now and are like, yeah, I think you'll, I think you'll love it. <laughs> yeah. And you also signed on for a film about Harriet Tubman as well. Yes, absolutely. It's a long time of coming. Um, Harriet is a hero to me and so many of us and uh, I'm super excited to be a part of that cast. I don't know if I can reveal what character I am right now, but um, I'm very excited uh, to tell her story. She's a great American hero. Yeah, and um, we have a few audience questions. That The first one, um, would you ever be involved with a Broadway or off-Broadway musical or play? Yes, I would. <laughs> if, I, if I could write it, if I could have, you know, uh, the opportunity to bring a new story. I would love to do that. Yeah. I would love to do Dirty Computer on Broadway. <laughs> I wanted to do the Arc Android. I, I want to do all the albums on, on Broadway. We should make that happen. <laughs> and from Gabby B, what makes you the most excited about the future? Uh, what makes you the most scared? We, what, who asked that question? We will be here B. all day, Gabby B, answering that. <laughs> Whew. Um, I will say that obviously as, as, as a woman watching what has recently happened with the Kavanaugh case, with what's going on um, in politics, this election is happening. I'm really scared. I'm, I'm scared for our country. Um, I'm scared that, that men in those positions of power will continue to abuse their power if we don't all get aligned and get refocused and start, one, with making sure that we are registered to vote, making sure that we actually show up on November 6th do you know between the 2012 election and this recent one, there was a 7% uh, decline in terms of black voters? What if that 7% would have showed up? Like, what if? And I just don't want us to get to a place where we're just like, oh well, this is it's not gonna help. Because let me tell you, watching those, that Kavanaugh case, and some people may agree with me or may not, and that's fine, but I have the mic right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> watching that just reminded me that somebody actually voted for those senators to be where they are. Like, somebody voted for them, and that is this, the decision that we got. A woman poured her heart out, told her truth, and there was not even an extensive investigation around it, it was just, thrown out because they wanted to save the party and wanted to remain in the position of power. It was party over women. And that type of stuff scares me because it can continue, they can continue to hire people that will enable that sort of behavior. And so we have to do everything that we can, not just women, but men, despite our disagreements, we have to take care of each other. and. Um, I'm hopeful, though, that at this point, um, I'm hopeful. Let me see, what am I hopeful about? <laughs> <laughs> I do believe, though, that there are a lot of people who didn't make the right decision um, as it pertained to voting and as it, you know, it was just, it was, yeah. I, I'm, I'm hopeful that now, people are able to see where we are and the things that you didn't think were gonna happen are happening. And I'm hopeful that we will, we will band together and we will create a world that works not just for some of us, but for all of us. And I'm also hopeful about this food that I'm going to eat after I leave here. <laughs> I'm hopeful that I can have some bread and butter. 
Um, and next question is, do you have any advice for young queer people trying to find their place in the LGBTQ plus community? Do I have any advice? I don't feel like I, I can speak for, for everybody. I think, you know, my decision to, to discuss, you know, my personal um, sexual orientation was one that uh, I had to be ready to discuss. I think that, you know, you shouldn't put pressure on yourselves to um, fit into any group. You know, um, I think that it's it's a beautiful thing when we can support each other and when we can um, celebrate each other's differences, even you know, in the community. Um, but I will say, be patient with yourself, be kind with yourself, um, understand that you know, sexuality is a spectrum. Um, and yeah, just just be patient with yourself, you know, and and don't feel a need to um, like I was having this conversation with someone, and they were just like, I just want everybody to just be out and out. There are some people who are in families where they're disowned. Some people are killed. Because they, you know, and we can't. We have to just remember that some of us are in more safer environments where I have people that love me and care about me and, and that can support me. And I would just say, in general, let's be more kind to each other and let's be less judgmental and let's um, let's love on each other through us trying to to find ourselves and 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 evolve as as human beings first and foremost. And uh, the next one is about the music on Dirty Computer. A few songs seamlessly con connect into one another or praise each other's instrumental riffs. Did you conceptualize these songs as a singular work during production or separated works that ended up connected by chance? Can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, a few songs on Dirty Computer seamlessly connect into one another or reprise each other's instrumental riffs. Did you... Wait, what did praise each other? Reprise. Reprise, okay. Yeah. And did you conceptualize these songs as a singular work during production or separated works that ended up connected by chance? Ah, okay. You see, prob we're probably talking about uh, Screwed into Django. <laughs> yes, and I did that on, on Arc Android as well. We, we, we did that with, uh, was it Locked Inside? And fa Faster into Locked Inside. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Yeah, um, that's a true, that's a true, I love you, whoever asked that question. You are, you've been with us. They, they started out singular, and some of them are in the same key, and, and we were just like, you know, I wanna make sure that we um, make a moment where the album, I, I've always wanted the album to feel cohesive and connected, and that was just the way that I felt, uh, and Nate felt, and Chuck, we all agreed that if we could connect the songs musically, um, you could have the option of you know skipping to each one, or you can have the option of just going through the journey seamlessly. So it was just about vibe and, and convenience, and also um, not wanting to interrupt that experience. Like whenever I'm listening to an album, I, I want to, I, I want to feel like I'm going through this journey with this person and I would never want to do like a compilation of just songs where everything is just, it's like, no, each song depends on the next song. And Megan wanted to know what you are most proud of. What am I most proud of? That's a great question. Um, I think I'm, as it pertains to me, okay. <laughs> um, I'm most proud that I didn't allow perfection to get in the way of me creating this time around. 
Um, there were many times that I was very afraid and, and scared and um, I didn't know what, you know, my supporters, what the, anybody that liked my music or style, I didn't know what they were gonna think of me when, you know, I would put out an album and, and this album in particular, um, when I would, you know, be a little bit more open with uh, who I am. I still don't wanna discuss who I'm dating or my personal life. I'm not interested in that, but when I decided that I, 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 I did wanna um, talk more candidly about certain things, I just didn't know what people were gonna say. I didn't know if it was, it was if I was gonna be judged, if I was um, gonna lose some folks. And um, you know, the night I, I released the album, um, the night when the Rolling Stone article came out, like I had knots in my stomach, I didn't sleep. It was just a lot, and I'm, I'm proud that the daughter of Janice, that's my mom's name, the granddaughter of Bessie, um, still fought for, for my truth and for my ideas, um, and I did not allow fear to get in the way of my freedom. And this one is very fun. Um, Sahara wanted to know, if you were the headmistress of your own secondary school, what would be the mandatory classes you would have taught? Interesting. That is fun. I actually do want to start a school. Yeah, I want to start a performing, performing arts school. Um, I, what would be my courses? Well, one, I would want to teach a course on empathy Yep, empathy, just that's it. <laughs> that's it, everyone come in and let's, let's really work on exercises that can help us empathize with each other more. Um, is allyship a word? Because I just made it up if it's not. Yeah. Okay, a course on allyship, how we can be better allies to each other. You know, what, what can assist white male or woman do to help protect a young LGBTQIA person? Um, how can I, as a black woman, be a better ally to my Latina, Latino brothers and sisters? You know, how can we really protect each other and remind each other that this is a civilization that literally works? That, well, it, it literally takes us taking care of each other for us to all to survive. Um, I would, so allyship, empathy. Then I would have a fun class <laughs> where everybody got the opportunity to dress up, or not dress at all, and <laughs> dance. If you wanted to be nude, if you wanted to be clothed. <laughs> well wait, now we're getting in like age and stuff, so then it'll be like, <laughs> she's over here a brothel or something crazy okay I'm, I'm going too far but just something that allowed I think I would have a balanced curriculum I think balance <laughs> balance is important you know what I'm saying like it needs to be balanced whatever it is like it cannot just be work 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 we have to have some play 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 and to to wrap things up I know that for a lot of people dirty computer has been a beacon in kind of a, a crazy 2018 to put it lately. Um, what has been for you, what has, what has been your beacon or what are things that have gotten you through this year, the music, the people, the art, the anything that's been really important to you this year? Well, because I've been on tour, being able to see faces, I see some of the Thandroids right there, hey, they are at these shows. They are not <laughs> gonna miss and I love y'all for that. Y'all got y'all merch on, like that is amazing and I'm forever thankful. Being able to see so many folks from different walks of life. There, 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 are, there are people who are bringing their parents who don't go to concerts, people are bringing their babies. And to look out and to see the sea of people who are not concerned with 
sexual orientation, politics, race, they are, we're all connected over the music. We're all connected um, over love. To be able to look out and know that love brought these people here. The love of other people who are oftentimes marginalized. To stay there and say, I want to support this message um, is inspiring to me. It keeps me, when I'm tired, when I'm just like, man, I don't know if I can do another two hour show, because my shows are like two hours every night. It's like high energy. And whenever I think about that, I just think about all those people who uh, this show or, or this album um, has changed their life in some way. You know, I hear so many stories. Like, I came out to my person, and as a black woman, I came out to my family, or as a black woman, I feel this way. And I just, I was just trying to speak from a truthful way. I was keeping that in the back of my head, but to actually see it happening before my eyes, thousands and thousands of people, that is something that humbles me. It, it makes me um, never want to really complain when I'm tired. I'm just like, this is what we need. Music has the power to heal and let me continue to do it, even if I don't do it for myself, let, let me do it for, for those that are, are showing up um, here. And so that's been inspiring to see. Um, I love watching my, my, my friends win, like Lena Waif. Love watching Yara Shahidi, uh, Amanla, um, Issa Rae. Um, I can go, I, I can name so many other women that I'm inspired by. You know, whenever I'm looking and I'm feeling uncomfortable or unsure, uh, I just look at them walking in their truth and I just, I get the courage to continue to walk in mine. And so that's what I'm inspired by right now. Well, thank you so much for speaking with me today and thank you guys for coming. <laughs>